answering your tough financial questions for the past 26 years. It's Allworth's Money Matters with co-hosts Scott Hansen and Pat McLean. This week's show was pre-recorded at an earlier date. Would you like an opinion on a financial matter you're dealing with? Whether it's about retirement, investments, taxes, or 401ks, Scott Hansen and Pat McLean would like to help you by answering your call to join Allworth's Money Matters. Call now at 833-99-WORTH. That's 833-99-WORTH. Welcome to All Worth's Money Matters. I'm Scott Hansen. I'm Pat McLean. Glad you are joining us on this, uh, whenever you're joining us. This is <laughs> whatever day it is. <laughs> well, no, I mean, uh, you may be listening to via terrestrial radio, or you may be listening via podcast, podcast. or you might not have left your house there are so for many podcasts now. 27 days. I've never met anyone that didn't have a podcast. Everyone I know has a podcast. I was taking <laughs> yoga the other day, and the guy's like, hey, have you ever listened to my podcast? Well, like, naturally, I've listened to your podcast. <laughs> yoga podcast. <laughs> what do you do? We're your gonna have feet a- <laughs> are one with the earth. <laughs> I want you to push each toe, starting with the pinky. Do you ever do yoga? Into the earth, your pinky, the next oh, toe, all I, the way to the big oh, I, toe. We, we got it. We got it. We got it. Everything you need is within we get yourself. It. <laughs> we get it. I did yes, yoga, I though. I take yoga every once in a while. I was, I got to tell you, I, I was, anyway, this is a financial I talk know. show, but I was sore after doing yoga. And I think I don't do well in yoga. I'm too competitive, and I see some guy that's <laughs> that got his, right? he's got his his foot behind his head, his head. I'm like, I can do that, and then I try and I hurt myself because I can't do that. I don't have the patience. I'm sitting there like, oh god, I, I gotta, this downward dog thing. How long are we gonna stay here? Yoga's, I did it. I did it. Let's move on. What's the next? Yoga is not a competitive sport, by the way. And they say, listen to your body. No, I don't want to. I hurt. I want to ignore the pain, push through the pain. Okay. Well, this is, let's get back to, uh, we have, this is a financial talk show. (laughs) You've tuned us in. Maybe you've found us by mistake, but we take phone calls. People. Yes. And if you're thinking, get onto the finance, quit talking about this other stuff. I find it boring. Uh, um, sorry. <laughs> go, go go get your own podcast. Sorry. That's what I'm going to say. All right, we do talk about, uh, both myself and my co-host here are both financial advisors. We've been practicing financial advisors for three decades and um, uh, still very much very much enjoy this, this industry. And partly, you know what, um, why I think, why you're wise by listening to this program and maybe other programs like this is that we found that the more educated you are, the wiser decisions you'll make and the more confidence you're going to have with your finances, which will lead to more peace when it comes to your, to your, to your money. Scott, I listen to financial talk shows all the time, and half of them are uh, nothing but disguised index annuity sales oh, presentations. Oh, those, yeah, those are terrible. They'll talk about protect, 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 protect. They're just trying to sell product. They're selling product. Selling product, making commission. Yeah. If you're, yeah, yeah. But we have a... We own an investment advisory firm. We manage over $8 billion. We get paid a fee to manage people's money. If you so choose to hire us, we would like that. If you just want to listen to the show like or call too. us and ask us questions, that's good too. Yeah, absolutely. But we just hope people make wise choices with their money. Hopefully. And don't get taken advantage by... Index annuity salespeople or life insurance disguised as an investment. So anytime uh, an investment comes with a physical... It's not an image. My friend's mother, did I mention this in the show a few weeks ago? 81 year old mother. They sold her, uh, uh, she had like 110 grand in the bank. She's already sold a couple annuities. 81, they took $80,000 and put it in a single premium life insurance policy, universal life index, universal life insurance policy. The bank did? No, some. Someone who was estate planning, someone had sold them a, sold their trust years prior, called and said, we need to come over and re- review your stuff. And they had this thing that talked about taxes. Now it's tax-free. She had the most modest estate, had a, a, a modest home that was paid for. And, and so my friend called me, Scott, was this legit? I'm like, it made my blood boil. Could you reverse it? No, it had been four years. Oh, well, then it's too late. And then surrender charges are significant. At that point in time. Just, What's a surrender charge? It is a penalty if you take the money out early. And at that four years, it was probably... I mean, I, it, there, there could have been... I told my friends, that like, it could have been... I mean, there could have been a lot worse things. But it wasn't good. But if a list of things your 81-year-old mother needed was a, a, a huge life insurance Single policy... Single premium. 
life insurance. And the death benefit was barely more than the deposit amount. They put it. Did it have any long term care? No, I don't know. It was a guard. It was just. Yeah, well. Well, as I got, I just looked at that. I'm like, and it and hit the, ah. your friend didn't find out about it until three or four years after it happened. And anyway. he just think that he thought it seemed the whole thing sounded fish. Well, they someone called. They want to come out and visit him. They wanted to visit. No, I think they reached out to this supposed trust company, oh. but they changed the name and something else now. And you didn't mention it. You, you I was angry. I was so angry, and that's why. Look. We talk sometimes. No one likes a bitter advisor, by the way. (laughs) (laughs) But no, here's the thing. Life insurance is great when you need life insurance. Most 81-year-olds do not need life insurance. That's right. 81-year-old widow. Most 60-year-olds don't need life insurance. That's correct. You need it to protect an income stream that's going to be dependent upon either your life, wage, or an income stream like a pension that would cease when when you died. Then you may need some replacement money there. Most of the time, term insurance works fine. I think the world would be better off without any whole or universal life insurance. Any of that, the world would be better off if those products didn't exist. The world would be better off if any annuities didn't exist. Having said that, there are times and places when both those products may make sense. But because they're so misused, the world would be better off had they not existed. There are rare, rare occasions. And oftentimes the, they're, the average, they're sold because they have a very high YTB, yield to broker. The, the average consumer can't tell when it should be used, not used, and what's good or bad. Anyway, let's I go to- I won't be bitter. Let's go I'm to- I'm a happy guy. If you want to join this show, what's our phone number? 833-99-WORTH is the number to be part of the program. 833-99-WORTH. And let's talk with Martha. Martha, you're with All Worth's Money Matters. Well, good morning. You guys need to stress less. <laughs> stress less? <laughs> You're probably right. <laughs> you, a more yoga. You, listen, more yoga. <laughs> you, live, you live in a house with... Uh, th- I did th- run this morning. That takes my stress away. But Martha, you live in a house where three of your, your, your children have moved back home uh, that were in college happily away from me. <laughs> More yoga. <laughs> they're going. They're going in the right direction anyway. All right. So, what can we do for you? Um, my questions were on charitable advisors fund. I believe uh, that's the correct phrasing. Um, you talked about it a little bit on your last podcast, and um, I was a little confused about how much and how long the rules have changed for contributing to an advisors fund. Yeah, so I, what, I, what you're referring to is what's uh, – they're called donor-advised funds. Or charitable gift donor. funds, okay. but they're donor-advised funds. Yeah, it's, they fall under the tax load as donor-advised funds, and these are available through – most of the big brokerage firms have – Fidelity's has the largest one. They were the ones that came out with these uh, years ago. But also, like, uh, community foundations will also have donor-advised funds. So based upon your community, there's probably a community foundation there that you can have a donor-advised fund. Uh, and the way these work, they're almost like private foundations. Or, I mean, so you can contribute to these. They, a donor advised fund technically is a nonprofit. They're a 501c3 in and of itself. And the way they operate is when money goes in there, whoever the donor is, the donor controls where the dollars are invested and the donor controls when the monies are going to be distributed and to which charities they're going to be distributed. Partially, Scott. Because you can only recommend a grant. You can't, not every charity is actually approved for receiving a grant. So you can recommend a grant. Yeah, that's correct. Mm Because that that charity could always reject a recommendation. That's right. So they uh, do have that power. So it. So you can put. But you can put, you can leave money in there years. Right oh, now, there's no requirement on taking it out. But there is for tax deductions. There's a percentage of your income. Yeah, but what I'm in. saying is, you can contribute a thousand dollars in a donor advice fund and leave it there for twenty years. Yeah, and correct. not ever distribute it. You that's get correct. the write-off, the tax deduction when you put the money in, the day you put it in. But you'll never get that money back. It sits in this donor advised fund until you recommend a grant, which means please send They're it to probably, this charity. My opinion, there probably should be some limit on what t- a time frame it should be distributed, but that's my opinion. But so I, uh, so uh, j- full transparency. So, uh, so I, why would a charity refuse a grant? Oh no, no. So it's not the charity that refuses the grant; it's the donor advised fund. So if 
if the oh. charity that you're recommending the money goes to hasn't been around for very long, let's just say it was set up in the last year or it didn't, mm -hmm. they or it didn't seems know. fishy. You're going to invest in the Serbia or a, uh, <laughs> whatever uh, a thing that it, they can not take your recommendation for a grant, but that's very, very rare out of. Uh, so I've used one for over 20 years. I've only had one recommendation that was actually denied when I asked money to go to a certain you charity. Did. I've never had any denied. I did. Oh. And it was a relatively new charity. It had been in, in place for six months, but I went back a year later and said, Hey, can you send money to this charity now? And they're like, yeah, no problem. Yeah. Um, but you could put up, what's the tax up to 50% of it's your this income? This year it's up to 60%. Actually, I think the, I think the, um, care, the latest it's act, the, uh, cares, cares act, act increased it even further. Most people aren't. Yeah. No, no, this year you can contribute up to hundred percent of your income and so, take a tax deduction or a security is up to 30%. Prior to this year and next year, when this outside the CARES Act, it's sixty percent of your adjusted gross income you can take in, and thirty percent. And if you exceed that, it rolls over to future years. Does that answer your question? Okay. Yes, it and does. Twenty percent if have... it's assets that aren't. Anyway, there's a few more rules around that. If you're given that much, get some tax advice beforehand. Okay, and I had one other question in regard to that charitable giving. How do you decide how much you can give based on your Portfolio, oh, oh, percentage your, oh, like, uh, like, what do you mean? So it does. So you don't interfere with your retirement income. Ah. Oh, well, that's a completely different. Years. That's a completely different question. Um, we, it, everyone's different, Martha. We don't know, right? So you you don't know if it, you could have a million dollars in your retirement. So, and if you're not going to spend the money on yourself, then. Any number is appropriate. If you need that million dollars to live on, then no money is appropriate. Well, some money okay. still may be appropriate. So what do well, you... Well, there must be... I'm thinking there must be some kind of guidelines on how you how you look at what your port, how much your portfolio is and, I guess, deduct your monthly expenses, your yearly expenses, and then go from there? That would be yes. a start. But every... I mean, for look, I, I've talked to Martha. Here's the, I mean, I've talked to people that I, 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 mean, I think of this friend of mine, <laughs> very modest lifestyle. They lived in a very small home. They had saved the money up. They're about to do a remodel. He told me the story. He and his wife watched some program about, I don't know, someone is dire straits. And the program is over. They're both crying. They said, how can we justify building ourselves a bigger house when this is going on in the world? And they gave that money away. For them, that was the right thing. That's just, that's just, how they very modest lifestyle, and they've given away the majority of his income. I wish I had friends like that. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you, you need that. <laughs> so, but then I've talked to other people who who their their viewpoint is: Look, I remember talking to this one guy, millions of dollars. He says, "Hey, I grew up in the Bronx. Everything I've got, I've worked hard for myself. I'll be damned if I'm going to give this to anybody else." That's his mindset, right? So everyone's got their own kind of mindset. <laughs> mindset, okay. um, and. But I don't know if there's anything right or wrong what somebody – and I think I've cautioned people both directions. I've cautioned people saying, look, I appreciate that you're, this is important to you. You just need to understand the cost. There's a cost, and the cost is that you can't afford your current lifestyle. So, Martha, here's what mm -hmm. you think about it. You need a charitable giving plan, if you, which it sounds like you're charitably inclined, but you're worried about how much money you're giving. One of the ways you can actually do it is – give a very minimal amount and name uh, charities as the beneficiary on your IRA. Or, yes, or, yes, I've done that, yes. Okay. Um, not your home, right? So if you've got children, you're better off leaving things that aren't taxable to the children and things that are taxable like IRAs to charities because charities don't pay tax. Yes. But it sounds like you actually need to sit down with someone and talk about charitable giving. Yeah, and it really put some planning into this because it, it, there's no like rule of. There, I mean, you asked for a rule of thumb. I, I mean, I guess I mean Israelites said ten percent, and a lot of a lot of religions will say ten percent as a tithe. Right. But but that's yeah. Now, another aspect of this, if you have a large carryover um, for a, a loss on your income taxes, does it make 
still make sense to do the advisors fund, the charitable, the donor advisors fund? Well, it or does it matter? It what may. Does it have anything to do with it? Well, how they might have well, you, you're, you you can only carry over three thousand dollars a year. You could use three thousand, otherwise it continues to carry forward in, against indefinite. capital gains. Right, right. So how big's your loss so, carry forward? It's over two hundred thousand. Whoa, whoa! Uh, a real estate deal gone bad? No. Tax harvesting. When this year? Um. Yes. Okay, well, that's good. Uh, did you decide that or did your advisor? Advisor. Good. You've got a good advisor. Uh, you've got a good I would advisor. Have the, so I would have these conversations with your advisor. Here, here's the thing. Financial planning, um, it, it, I think the, the, the bedrock of it is really having things set up in a matter to meet what your goals and objectives are, right? Mm-hmm. There's money in it. What is money? I mean, money in and of itself is just... Money. It's a tool that can be used for good, can be used for evil, can be used for all kinds of things. And having a lot of money in and of itself is not is not not a good or a bad thing. It all kind of depends. And I think what's important is to is to is for you to really determine what you want these dollars for. What what's the purpose here? What's your lifestyle needs? And then what are what are your other goals? What's important to you? And then develop the financial plan around that. And but but by the way, so here's what, it, and so I assume they uh, harvested uh, losses six eight weeks ago. Um, it was done um, March April, yeah. There we Were go. Were the monies reinvested back into the things that appreciated since then? Uh, yes. Okay, okay. So so let's Perfect. whoever your advisor is, uh, kudos, right? Assuming Good. they were invested back in the growth assets and they weren't putting aside them. Okay. Well, that's okay. Thank you. Thank <laughs> I you. mean, thank you for that. We don't know. We really don't know what, <laughs> what happened, but they did actually recognize that there was a tax opportunity here. Um, and you may actually, there might be. Assuming if, it was invested and reinvested. Uh, in some, is that, similar. is that assumption fair that they were reinvested in similar yeah. assets? Yeah. I, uh, yeah. Similar, yeah. but not identical. Yeah, I'd sit down with your advisor and say, you know, all this tax loss, driving, that's all fine and dandy. What's really important to me is figure out, this is what I'd like to do. How do I make this happen in my life? And then mm-hmm. go from there. And and by the way, you may end up, depending upon whether they are indexed or non-indexed or actively traded, by the end of the year, you may actually recognize a lot of those gains back to offset that, um, that yeah, loss. Yeah, you got a lot of losses to carry forward. So like gifting, gifting a, a an appreciated asset to a donor advice fund may or may not be, be of, of value to you because of the losses. That's right. This year. Or that's a lot of losses. I know, but you got to assume the portfolio is probably a million yeah, plus, right? I would think so. Yeah. Anyway. Anyway. Appreciate the call, Martha. Um, let's continue on. We're going to talk with Linda. Linda, you're with All Worth's Money Matters with Scott Hansen and Pat McLean. Hi there. Thanks for taking my call. Yeah, our pleasure. Um, this question regards um, refinancing a home loan. All right. Now, I refinanced back in December. And uh, it was mainly to lower the interest from about a 4.3. I wound up getting uh, a 3.6 awesome. um, with an APR of somewhere in the 3.8s. Um, but I, in speaking to them, I found that it was going to take me over two years to make up the costs to break even on the loan. You know, with all of the fees, the points, the t- everything that um, there was no, they didn't, I didn't need an appraisal, but with everything else, and uh, that made me wonder. I hear a lot of um, different advertisements now for 30-year fixed loans, 3%, 2.85 in their advertising, no costs at all, no title, no ec- uh, escrow, no appraisal, mm-hmm. no lender fees. Uh-huh. Um, and I just wondered in the summer, as I said, 3%, summer 2.85. Yeah. So here's how, what, 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 Scott, may I, how, how big is this mortgage? One, it's one, now it's 174. How old are you? 75. And do you have $174,000 outside of an IRA or brokerage account anywhere? No. Okay. All right. So are you single or are you married? Um, uh, widowed. Sorry about that. Um, and are, is it easy for you to make these mortgage payments? Or do you have plenty of other cash flow at retirement? 
Um, I would like to lower it if possible. So, but, I mean, you so, know, I mean, it would be nice. It would be nice to owe less. And what's the value know? of the home? I mean, it was. It was. Excuse me. The value is. It, they appraised it at around between four and four twenty-five. And what's your annual income? About fifty. And uh, it when when you pass away, when you leave this earth, where will this money? Where will all these assets go? With a home, uh, to family. And what do you have as far as do you have a pension now? Yes. And do you have much as far as IRAs or other savings? No. Well, no. I would do a reverse mortgage. I, <laughs> I knew you were going to go exactly there. That's exactly right. I'd do a reverse mortgage. It is a reverse mortgage. If you were my mother, I'd like, just no do a question reverse about mortgage. It. You're my mother, I would beg you to do a reverse mortgage. Spend it all. And here's how they work. Okay? Your home's worth $400,000. You owe $175,000. You're 75 years of age. You have a mortgage that you're make, making payments on every month. Some is interest. Some is going to the principal. So that 30 years down the road when you were... 105 years old, the home will be paid off. Right? A reverse mortgage, you're not wanting to, you don't want to take cash out of a house to go spend frivolously or anything. All we're talking about is using a reverse mortgage to pay off your mortgage. So you have a reverse mortgage, it eliminates your $175,000 mortgage as far as your payments are concerned. Now, there's still a mortgage balance on the home of $175,000, but what happens is rather than you having to make those payments, the interest just accumulates on itself. So at next year, you'll owe $180,000 on the home. The year after that, you'll owe $187,000 on the home. And it just keeps going up. Presumably, right? the value of your home is going to be going up. So the only one you're hurting in this is your heirs. They don't get quite as much. And quite I don't want to do that. But they're, not, but they're still, whatever equity you have is still there. They don't, uh, so it's essentially... Um, you're giving less money to your heirs rather than making a mortgage payment. So if you don't want to do that, I'd keep the mortgage I had today. I wouldn't refinance. You don't think these refinancings, they, are they gimmicks or? No, what happens is, here's how it works. I mean, so let's say that mortgage you had at 3.6%, they could have offered to you and said, Martha, we're going to, I tell you what, the, rather than pay any fees, the mortgage, the rate will be 3.7%. And they, so it's a little higher. They and sell these mortgages into the secondary market. They, 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 they cover the fees that are involved, and they get made up. They, then when they sell the mortgage to the market, they make a little money on it because they've got a mortgage at a higher rate than— And then, and then they reimburse the fees associated with that. But I would seriously look at it, reverse mortgage. You've got about $250,000 in equity. If you use a reverse mortgage, 10, if you, and you died 10, 20 years from now— there's odds, statistically speaking, your kids are still going to get much more than two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Well, I don't want those. them. I don't want them to get the money. I want them to get the house. Do they want the house? Yes. Okay. okay. Well, then uh, leave yes. everything alone. All right. But they would still get the house anyway in a reverse mortgage. They just have maybe. to get it with a mortgage on. And it. And if they want the house, maybe they can help make the mortgage payment today. Well, as uh, the way it is right now with the things today, that's not possible. Right, that's well, why I was wondering with this three two point eight five or three percent um, is with no fees, with no closing costs, no fees. No, I mean, is is that a gimmick when they say no? No, it's not. It's not a gimmick. It's not a gimmick. And no. it's if it's you know if it's worth your while, you give a call to them and it's, see see if they can do it. And if it lowers your interest rate from three point six to three point two. And there's no cost associated it, and it's a 30-year mortgage. Yeah, they say 3.3 percent uh, or 2.85 rate and APR. Well, that's what they say on the ad. Yeah, call well, and have a conversation. Would... Yeah, call. Them. Yeah, if, I mean, if you can get your rate down slightly, it doesn't matter. Reamortize yeah. it over 30 years, lower your rent payment, more money for your yeah. kids to inherit. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, if you have a 30-year mortgage, reality, it's going to take. 30 years to pay it off. So unless you live to 105, there will be some mortgage balance on the house when they. But call them. See what they say. Okay. All that's, right. That's Hopefully it'll be. And there's possibility of, you know, I can always um, double the amount or add a little more to it Why? every year. And, and, you know, I mean, I can always. Pay but your children in that, those. are they in that financial disarray that. They, they need your house the day you die? Well, I think everybody, uh, at certain levels, everybody is right now. So. Um, but and in California, 
and okay. if you're trying to get a house. All right. The price, the, the price of real estate is so overpriced right now okay. that anything is ridiculous. So if they wanted this, there really would probably be no way. All right. So call them and see what they say. Uh, but if you can lower it a quarter or a half a percent and there's no dollars out of pocket, then you should do so. Yep. P- appreciate okay. the call. Thanks All a right. lot for your help. Appreciate yeah, it. Thank you. Appreciate that. So, and you know, I think that's a good example of uh, a, a good financial advisor's job is to try to determine what it is that you are trying to accomplish and then structuring things that is going to best serve what your goals and objectives are. Yeah. So, right. So yeah. she wants that house to go to yeah. her kids. And if she wants to try to pay it off in five or 10 years, then good for them. Yeah. And a good financial advisor's job is to make sure that things are structured in such a manner that that would be reality. And by the way, reverse mortgages aren't good for most people. That yes. <laughs> so you heard us promote a reverse mortgage for this particular lady, Linda. Um, it's pretty rare that we would say that. But when the times when they do make sense, they can make tremendous sense. Particularly if you're a widow with no other income, then yes. it makes tremendous sense. We're going to take a quick, quick break here. When we come back, we will continue on. This is All Worth's Money Matters with Scott Hansen and Pat McLean. This week's show was pre-recorded at an earlier date. Can't get enough of Allworth's Money Matters? Visit allworthfinancial.com slash radio to listen to the Money Matters podcast. Welcome back to Allworth's Money Matters. Scott Hansen and Pat McLean. Thanks for, financial matters. thanks for uh, staying tuned or just joining us. Or... Is there a... Trying to look at, you know, since we have all these articles that some people want us to talk about, and uh, so what do you one, want? This one doesn't look very interesting. <laughs> okay. Stock market turmoil took toll on five twenty nine accounts. No duh. Of course. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> what would you think? <laughs> <laughs> Stock market declines lead to losses. <laughs> wow. Um, you know, markets have recovered quite a bit. Significant. So, and if you found yourself that you've got some money in the markets that are needed to be used for expenses in the next few years, do not wait for them to hit any new highs. Oh yeah, if you need the money in the next three to five years, make Take sure it out that now. they're that Take they're it out now. In, in relatively liquid. Correct. Uh, they now. aren't. Yes. So you've got a kid that's going to well. What I don't know what colleges open in the fall. I guess USC said they're having students plan on coming on campus. But the, I think the UC, is, it's all still remote learning. Uh, my son goes to UCLA, and he says he's coming. They think they think he's going back. But he started an internship this this week, <laughs> virtually. This is Tom? Yeah. Yeah, yeah he's, he's, he's going to do just fine. He's fine. <laughs> <laughs> actually, that kid. <laughs> that, it's, it's actually, he's, uh, what is he, my third child, but it's, Arguing with that kid is like arguing with myself. My wife says, I've never seen anyone fight with himself like you when you fight with your son. <laughs> but uh, in any case, if you've got money that you're, you're planning on using for, maybe you're planning on moving out of moving at retirement, you're going to use to buy a new home or your kids' college expenses or take it out have, of the market, have money that's going to be. Don't put it at risk. I mean, if it's for a luxury you're planning on in the future, then you might, you can, maybe you can. Take half of it out. Afford that risk or whatever. Yeah, but any money that you expect to use in the next three to five years, uh, don't put it at risk. I because would quite frankly, um, this market turbulence doesn't, uh, it, it, it appears to be over, um, but my guess is it isn't. Um, I might be wrong. I hope I'm wrong. I hope that it does nothing but go up, but... Um, well... Just because it went up doesn't mean the the risk left. I always get people, it's funny, and I know you agree with me, Pat, but I get much more excited about companies' earnings growing up. I get excited about the economy growing much more than I do about just prices going up. I don't, when you've got um, companies' profits being squeezed like they are now and their price is high, their stock price goes up, that just doesn't. And I truly, as we talked about, I think it was our last week, it, I, I think it's a lack of alternatives for investments. Yeah. Which is driving a large part of this market. But, but apparently, I was looking, um, there was an article in Barron's this week, why protests rarely rattle markets. 
Well, that was someone's opinion. Well, I think I looked at some history. Yeah, I looked at some yeah. whatever. All right, 833-99-WORTH is the number to be part of the program. 833-99-WORTH. We're talking with Roger. Roger, you're with All Worth Money Matters. Hey, you guys hear me all right? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, I'm wondering about things like the national debt, all this excessive printing, these uh, what you call them, quantitative easing. Now, I know oh, that it's, no, pro- it's not a problem anymore. It's just this. Haven't you read this modern monetary theory that this uh, MMT exactly. and you just keep printing? It's no problem. Don't sweat it. What's your it's question? One of the Federal Reserve, yeah, as one of the Federal Reserve bosses said in an interview recently, oh, there's no end in sight. And he was excited about it. Um, my thinking is this um, shouldn't everyone try to save at least a small quantity of actual physical uh, precious metal like? you know, some gold coins or silver coins. I'm thinking to myself, like, you know, a cigar box full of silver coins is ideal to have tucked away besides whatever else you're invested in. Hyperinflation. I've looked at all these different cases like the continental currency, the American Civil War in the South especially, and we look at post-World War I, post-World War II, Zimbabwe, Venezuela, paper money that they had depended on just crashed so terribly that. In you know, some but cases, you know who do, you know who do, you know who do the best during those t- uh, after those periods are not the ones with the coins, but the ones that are connected politically and involved in the political change. They're the ones who always come out. So I, I totally hear sure, where you're do. coming from. Here's why I don't own any, and I think the same thoughts, Roger. And when it, we, our national debt is now at about twenty three trillion dollars. Which is more than 100 percent of our our GDP in a good in a normal year, and I think ha- when interest rates normalize at some point in time in the future, and our interest payments on our debt is actually a real number uh, above one, right? I mean, how how are we going to be able to to afford this? And to your point, one way to deal with uh, paying back a, the debt is just to hyperinflate your currency, and then 20 tr- 23 trillion dollars is nothing, right? Right. So and so there's a there's part of you can certainly say if we own some hard asset and it could be doesn't necessarily need to be coins. It could be something else, too, that's going to maintain its value. Well, I'm thinking about like when everything would crash, that if a person has something like that, I remember back during the gas crisis, they were actually accepting um, silver dimes in exchange for a gallon of gas, you know, things like that. and back in the German inflation, there were people that they literally got by just because they had spare change that they came across because all the paper was gone. It was terrible. Yeah, I, I've read quite a bit about that, um, which brought in the, the Nazis. <laughs> so how much... Uh, yeah. So how much, Here's why I don't have any. How, okay. I, cause, and I Go think ahead. the same thoughts. Maybe I take 5% and put it in some gold coins. And First of all, you got to find the right place to store it. But I think more of if things got that bad... Where my other 90 or 95% of my assets are now worthless. What's that 5% going to do for you? What am I going to do? Unless I have guns and want to come shoot my neighbor when he was trying, when he's <laughs> looking for food. No, I'm not. This is my thought I'm not, process. Yeah, I know. And I'm, I'm not like, I'm not that, that guy. I can't, I don't, I don't want to be that guy. I'm and so, maybe some other people are, I just for me, I just can't think that way. All right. Well, another example. There's this one girl that she had been captured by the Russians at the end of World War II. Okay. Well, she managed to it's only an hour show. Be short, be okay. Short. I, I know. Just very short. <laughs> but anyway, she, she, well, here's what happened, though. She managed to escape, and she wound up in an American military camp. And they invited her to come in and have something to eat. And she was taken by the sight of this loaf of bread on the table. Because at that time, with the German money entirely gone, with everything destroyed, one loaf of bread would cost you one gold ring. And that's what the value was at that time. So again, you know, when the money goes to crap, there are other things that people do, not just bartering and all that. But I'm just saying is that when we look at it, the the coins that used to be of value, and I'm just talking ordinary common silver stuff like 64 quarters and, you know, dimes from the 1950s, whatever. But that Roger, does have Roger, if value. you feel better, and you brought up mm-hmm. the examples of economies you brought up were also economies where they confiscated 
property. Zimbabwe, oh, true. Venezuela, so, the collectivized, but, oh, yeah. right? but, but and it, Germany if, as well. So if it, if it makes you feel better, then do it. Uh, but uh, it isn't. It, it's not a factor of production, right? What determines the value of gold or and or silver? The cost of actually getting it out of the ground, refining it, and turning it into gold and silver. At the end of the day, that's the true cost of gold and silver. Day to day, the price speculates based on the, the price moves based on emotion and speculation. But the real cost is the cost of actually refining it, finding it, getting it out of the ground, sure. refining it. But if it makes you feel better, yeah. do it. And I remember having this conversation literally 20, 29 years ago. Um, twenty. When was the first Gulf War? Or somebody? Uh, I remember this. Ha- I remember the guy specifically. This conversation. His name was Dick, uh, and it was the same kind of conversation. And it would have been an absolute disastrous investment. Yeah. But if you want to put a small percentage of a portfolio in and um, keep gold it or silver, then buried somewhere in your house, then have a good safe. Yeah. And but have a really good fireproof safe. Yeah. And and put it someplace that no one knows about it. And never mention it again. And if things are so bad that you're... Yeah, the gold won't matter. You need guns. And if you're food, occupied... Water. Right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and by the way, you can't have inflation without having higher... If, if you own companies that are raising their prices, the values of those companies are going to go up. If you own a piece of property... The property will go up. <laughs> with, right along with it. Um and if bread becomes the most valuable, look in Russia when the when the Russian ruble fell apart, vodka was the currency so, choice. Y- so let's talk about real estate for a second, Scott. Uh, this whole pandemic will change the way residential and commercial real estate looks like forever. It will never be the same. So be- the, because of the remote working, but, but yes. So the Silicon Valley, the tech workers, they did a survey. And the majority said that they would be willing to take a 20% decrease in wages in order to work remotely. This 20%. last week, Stitch Fit laid off, what percentage of their, I don't know if you saw this, they laid off a huge percentage of their employees, all California-based, and planning on um, hiring people outside of California. But, and because it's remote work, right? Right, they, they Stitch Fit is a subscription service where they send you clothes. You look at well, them. I think maybe men's too, but women primarily women's. Yeah, you look at them and then I you're like, know, oh, I like them or don't okay, like them, and then you send them back. Um, but twenty percent. So, so the average employee in the tech firms in San Francisco Bay Area said that they would take a twenty percent decrease in pay in order to work remotely. What's that mean? If you're planning on selling a house in San Jose right now, I would, wouldn't would wait. That's for yeah. sure. What it means is they want to move to Medford, Oregon, or Bend, Oregon, or whatever. They want to continue to work. They just don't want to live in that environment. It is. It's really going to be interesting. Yes. I mean, you look at all the people that are, they say New York, they can't get move, enough moving trucks if people leave in the city. Yeah. yeah. It, it will change and everything. And they've been on a, this tremendous uh, real estate build lately. It's um, and commercial buildings, offices, strip centers, retail. It'll it'll be different. Well, in some business, I tell you, I, I, I this is about four or five months ago. I flew, and you've done the same sort of trips, Matt. I flew to Miami for one two-hour meeting. Yes. Yeah. Right. I'm not doing that again. No. And there was there's certain business. I was talking about certain business that. Out of a kind of respect, it was it, these. They were expected for in-person visits, and some of those now, they're, they're not going to. It, it might be the opposite, where well, you sound foolish. You're going to come all the way across country, and it, that happens to us sometimes. Some investment banker or something wants to come out from New York to see us in Sacramento. You're like, why? They fly all the way out here for they're in the you feel for bad. Forty-five minutes. You right? feel bad. We've had those. We've had those meetings. I feel bad now, for these guys. Now, like, look, you get on a Zoom call, get on a. Google Meets call. That's it, so Microsoft. I don't care. It changes travel and yeah, really interesting uh, real estate forever. All right, let's continue. Uh, this is All Worth's Money Matters. We're t- in Kentucky talking with Wayne. Wayne, you're with All Worth's Money Matters. Hi, how are you guys doing? Great. How are you doing, Wayne? Just fine. I can't, uh, my question is kind of boring from the last one, I think, but uh, I don't know. I. 
Yes, I had a question about changing Canadian dollars to U.S. dollars. I worked in Canada for a while, and everything was direct deposited, and I just left it in the savings account in Canada. Yeah. And I trying to been, you know, I trying to watch the conversion rate, and it's kind of bounced back up a little bit. Is it back up a bit? I mean, it's not one I, 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 I mean, I, I, I go to Canada every couple of years for. Right, everything's and I, I love Canada, but the it, I always think of it as micro dollars because it's what's the exchange rate right now for Canadian dollars? I think it's like seventy four today, wow. seventy four cents, and it used to be almost equal when yeah. I first started yep. going. So, what's your so question for what, us? But it's uh, been it's typically about- it's typically been undervalued, and it was uh, right around the financial crisis. I think it got up to par, maybe it was even a little above the U.S. dollar for a while, and now it's kind of settled back down to where. I think it's been more historically. So how much money are we talking yeah. about? Uh, 85000 a little bit over 85000 And how old are you? Uh, I am 66, and it's just strictly an emergency fund. How long has it been there? Uh, I started there. I've been going since 2012. Some of it's been there for eight years. Some of it's like five years. And so you do you, do you go to Canada for vacation or for work or what? Uh, just for work. And you're still times. going? Uh, no, I'm retired, and okay. I just wanted to know what you thought about, you know, is there a good time to convert that, or... I would do it. I'd do it. Uh, I would say uh, we have no idea, and because I have no idea... I'd Nobody s- has any idea what the future... That right now, <laughs> the conversion is the collective thoughts of everyone in the marketplace. And so I would put a plan in place to probably do it over a two- or three-year period. Or right away. Mm-hmm. What's the difference? If, if What do you mean, what's the difference? Well, could go. What could he go doesn't down. need the money. Maybe it could could go up too. So why wouldn't you do it quarter now, quarter in six months, quarter in eighteen months, quarter in twenty four months? Whatever. Okay, that sounds good. That's <laughs> one. That's one strategy. That's one you opinion, can do, you can right? do it over three years, five years, twenty years. Uh, but the question is, he's asking us for guidance, and we, no one, no one, the market determines what the conversion so, rate is. Wayne's your brother. You're going to say, to, do it out over a three-year period. You try to just take it, bring it home, and don't worry about it. Don't what, percentage of, what percentage of your net worth does this represent? Uh, not that much. I mean, it's like I said, it's just in case something happens here, we are fine with our retirement, Got my it. wife and I. I do it. You know, it's just. I, so I would I do it in four steps or I do it in two. I do half now and I do half in twelve months. Scott's laughing at me. I am. I would do it right away. <laughs> I yeah. would do it. I would do it in two steps. It's, it, it, who knows what's going to happen in the future? Of course. And we're trying to mitigate oh, yes, risk. Exactly. So do exactly. it. Do it either in four steps or two steps. Put a plan in place. Don't worry about the exchange rate. Do half now and half in a year, or do a quarter of it now quarter of it in six months, quarter of it in 18 yeah. months, quarter of it in 24 months. You're mitigating risks. And that way you might be brilliant part of the time and you might be dumb part of the time. Because mm-hmm. their economy, it seems like, hinges totally on the oil and the oil prices, you know, went to pot. Well, no, so. but, and, and, and their economy actually uh, it contend, is contingent a lot on uh, Chinese, Chinese trade as well. So mm-hmm. um, no one knows where that's going to go. Sure. I mean, the only reason okay. I'd keep any money there is if you were going up there for extended vacations and you could use those dollars to help pay for your travel while you're there so you didn't have to worry about the currency fluctuation. But- uh, Scott says do mm-hmm. it all at once and don't worry about it. I say do it in steps. And there you go. you got two opinions there. But I wouldn't leave it there too long. The last thing you want to do is have it there and end up passing away and having to deal with getting the assets back to the U.S. That'd just be a disaster. That's, that's a fair oh, statement. I'll bet. Okay. That's yeah, a really, fair no, statement. really would be. That's a fair statement. Okay. Well, that sounds great. I'll try that and see what happens. All right. All right Appreciate Wayne. the call. Yeah. Good luck to you. Okay. You're very welcome. Right. Have a good day. Thanks. I remember Pat, my, my stepmom, who was my stepmom since I was about five, uh, she was from Great Britain. And she had had some money that she'd left there from when she moved over in her 20s that she always left there. And uh, she act- she left it there for uh, when she would go over every few years to go home to see her family. She always, by the way, she always told me how much better. Great, bro- we got this. What it is? <laughs> Back at home, the way it is. <laughs> we <have> better. <laughs> and the Irish, she did not like that. Bloody Irish. <laughs> <laughs> 
you'd see some, you know. And I liked the, your mom. <laughs> back in the, the day when the IRA would be doing something. <laughs> Bloody Irish. Okay, so and, she left money so, there. My, uh, but she would leave the money there, and every few years she'd be visiting, and she would use those dollars for travels while she was there. But, but then she got uh, sick. She came down with uh, stage four cancer. And she'd continue to leave it there. And I'm like, uh, Mom, you really need to get these dollars over. I'd like The last thing anyone here wants to try to do is figure out how we're going to repatriate these right. dollars when you're no longer. I mean, yeah, I, I couldn't can't imagine. Even imagine. And so did she bring them yeah, over? She did, yeah. Yeah, I can't even imagine. I mean, you'd actually have to. Uh, there's probably agents in Oh, I'm sure. Europe it would cost that, you a lot of money. Yeah. They, you would, it would cost you a lot of money by yeah. the time you got. Yeah. Actually, I I know a friend of mine actually finds um, wealth in uh, outside of the United States that are beneficiaries are in the U.S. And then he contacts them and says, "Hey, by the way, you're part of this estate, and you probably didn't know it, but if you give me thirty percent of the income, I will tell you where it's at, and I'll get it for you." That's Tell him I'm does. interested. Okay. Well, if he can find some money, <laughs> you'll pay him thirty percent. I'm happy to do so. That's. But that's his business. It's a strange business. I know of no family member was that? in the history of my genealogy that had much money anywhere. So, <laughs> so if much. he can find it, that'd be fantastic. I'd be really happy. <laughs> okay. I'll get 40. <laughs> okay. 40. 50. He can have 50%. Just of whatever he that finds, money. that's uh, money due me that I don't know about. Well, I think they find the money first and then find out oh, who owns shoot. it. <laughs> they don't start with the person <laughs> and then go looking for the I money. I like that idea. It sounded good to me. All right. Let's uh, continue on here. This is uh, Hanson and McLean's All Worth Money Matters. What I mean by Scott Hanson and Pat McLean. Um, for years, we were, the name was Hanson McLean. We rebranded, re- we changed our name about a year ago to All Worth. Because we added tax, estate planning, Medicare, and uh, we've grown our 17 and, offices right now in multiple states. Much more so than just Scott and Pat. And when we started, we were both young and it made sense at the time. And we didn't know any better. Let's, uh, I let's, paid three hundred dollars for my first logo, though, so I was pretty proud of that. There you go, and it was worth every penny. Let's uh, talk with Peter in Sacramento. Peter, you're with All Worth's Money Matters. Uh, hello, Scott. It's a pleasure being with you. I've always enjoyed listening to you. Why? Thank and you. picked up some great hints. Good. How can we help? Or how can I help? Uh, well, uh, today I'm calling about refining. I'm actually helping a neighbor refi a house. We're both uh, north of 75 years. Um, uh, She has a a comfortable, modest income of uh, approximately 40,000 a year and has been paying on her current house for about six years. Um, I finally convinced her to consider refining. And the question really leads me to wondering whether it is better for her to accept paying some additional points or just to do a uh, rollover of the remaining principal at, at uh, whatever the best rate we can get. So, uh, Peter, this is Pat McLean. I'm the co-host of the show. <laughs> um, so how much does she owe? Because when you started, it was all about Scott, but I'm here Pat's too. a little jealous. <laughs> a little potted plant here. Oh. He um, acts like he's got thick skin, but it's really, it's really, yeah, I'm really not quite a, soft. I'm not a potted plant. Um, how much does she owe on the house? Uh, approximately two hundred twelve thousand. And she's seventy. She's mid seventies. How, how much is the home worth? Uh, about four fifty. And and she lives on forty thousand dollars a year. His it, it correct does, social does, security and a small pension. And how much money does she have outside of that? Uh, I think she, approximately two hundred thousand from the sale of her of her larger previous home. And does she have heirs that she wants this money to go to the home to go to? Uh, she does have heirs, but she's not worried about them. There, you know, uh, we, so we had to call the first. We had to call the first half of this program. But very similar. If the, if this were my older sister or my mom, I would I'd do a reverse, highly recommend a reverse mortgage. A reverse mortgage, and get rid oh. of the payments altogether. Not to take cash out of the house, but to pay off the mortgage. And and then she no longer has a mortgage. When she f- First thing she needs to know, it's the last home she's ever going to live in if she does a reverse mortgage. And there's going to be less equity to her heirs because that interest payment that she's paying now and the principal payment gets added. The interest payment gets added to the reverse mortgage. That's It's a mortgage in reverse. So, yes. 
she does a reverse mortgage, she would this I looks like she could probably pay the whole thing off with yeah. a reverse mortgage. And let's say she lives another 15 years. At that point in time, she might owe $400,000 on the home, but the home might be worth five or 600000 And she never makes another mortgage payment. You've done it again. You've got right to the heart of the matter. That does seem to be the most logical, just not the first one that we would grab. Yeah. Well, I tell you, Peter, my father had a reverse mortgage. And he loved it. His brother got one, too. His older brother got one and told me how phenomenal it was. Um, my dad had a very modest home, but it was down in Los Angeles, worth a lot of money. And, um, it, and, and he ended up passing away. So I've, and I've, so I've dealt with what happens when someone dies with a reverse mortgage. Was there still equity well, there in the home? There was a lot of equity in the home. You sold the home, paid off the mortgage just like a regular mortgage. That's and exactly how and it, it went to the just heirs. Just like a normal mortgage. And yeah. all the equity was split amongst the heirs. The only one gets injured in a reverse mortgage is... If injured, that's not... Who gets injured? Well, I don't know. That's probably a strong word. Is if she moves out of the home, she's it, it's hard to buy another home. There's not as much equity. But the people that miss out on this are the heirs. Because right now, she's taking some of her money every month and putting it against the principal of the home. And paying the interest. And paying the interest so that when she dies, those people inherit more. That's all that happens. Uh, and if she lives 30 years, then the home could be paid off and they... You know, and they get a lot. But I... You know, she's... Psycho. How old is she? Uh, well, she's a little over 75. All right, she's 75, assuming she's still relatively healthy and whatnot. I mean... Yeah, good good 15... Right, good health. I mean, she could... Think about what she can do if she didn't have to make a mortgage payment. Yeah, she could take you to lunch... You go down to <laughs> Sizzler. No, but really. I mean, particularly, these are lifesavers, I think, particularly for someone like this, a, a single uh, individual, mid-70s or older, and, and using a reverse mortgage to pay off an existing mortgage. Now all that money you've been paying to a mortgage can go to... Yeah, keep the just, money, $2,000, $200,000, keep it invested, whatever it is. Yeah, and some people are listening to this show thinking we're idiots, uh, but this is the real right. life. Yeah. Well, I, look, I mean, ideally, I appreciate the call, Peter. I mean, ideally, you're at, re, at 75, you got house paid off, you got all this money in the bank, and you, you're worried about your required, and and you're worried about your, required minimum distribution. So and every, a, everyone loves you, and ideally, and you have nothing but friends <laughs> and free time. But the reality is many people find themselves at this stage in life with not a lot of other options. It's really think of it, your last trip to the well. But they can make a big difference when uh, appropriate and when needed. So, unfortunately, we're out of time. It's always, as usual, it's been great being here with you. Uh, we encourage you to go to our website, allworthfinancial.com. Pat and I did a, um, a digital event a week or so ago that you can get on there. Be a bull in a bear market. I think you'll enjoy it. Anyway, we're out of time. We'll see you next week. This has been All Worth Money Matters. This program has been brought to you by Allworth Financial, a registered investment advisory firm. Any ideas presented during this program are not intended to provide specific financial advice. You should consult your own financial advisor, tax consultant, or estate planning attorney to conduct your own due diligence.